We've got a fun show lined up for you today. It's all about Purple Martins, Doc. Yes, birds. It's going to be fun. Yeah, looking forward to this one. They're the largest swallow, and what makes these birds really unique is they're almost entirely reliant on human or man-made structures during the breeding season. You'll see the gourds and Purple Martin houses as you drive around, and so that's where they're nesting. And then when they go out and feed, I mean, they're feeding almost entirely on the wing, and so they're catching everything as they fly. They're only here just for a little portion of their annual cycle. Once they're done breeding, they form these large roosts. They've roosted at several different locations over time down in Nashville, and they can be 100,000 plus birds. Then they'll take another migratory path all the way down into South America where they'll spend the non-breeding season. Okay. And then after that, they'll come back and the, the cycle starts again. My question was, we've had these birds that are just nine miles south of Nashville. I wonder if our birds are joining that roost after they fledge, before they head down to South America. That's when we decided to put radio transmitters on some of our nestlings to see if they join that roost. And the first year, we put six transmitters on. Five of those birds we detected at the roost. And so that kind of answered our question. And my next question, the, the following year was, I wonder if other birds in other areas, you know, the surrounding areas. And so that's when I reached out to David and said, hey, you guys have purple martins. Would it be okay if we started putting transmitters on your birds here? And so that's how that sort of all got started. Awesome. Won't you take me back to Tennessee? The award-winning Tennessee Wildcast is on the air with the latest info about hunting, fishing, boating, wildlife watching, and all things outdoors. This year, we celebrate the men and women of the TWRA responsible for 75 years of wildlife conservation. Now make welcome your host, Jason Harmon. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this edition of Tennessee Wildcast. We're glad you're tuning in. Thanks for watching, for listening. We've got a fun show lined up for you today. It's all about Purple Martins, Doc. Yes, birds. It's going to be fun. Yeah, looking looking forward to this one. Yeah. Hey, uh, we got time for a radio station we shout We got out? all oh. kinds of time. Okay, WDEH. We appreciate them so much uh, in Sweetwater, Tennessee, where you can hear Wildcast from 7 to 7. 7.30 every Saturday morning. So we appreciate them and our other radio partners as well. Definitely. Appreciate those radio partners. Appreciate our TV partners and all of you out there watching and listening. So Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's great. And uh, I'm excited about today's topic. Uh, something a little bit different. And uh, I'm going to learn a lot because I don't know a whole lot about it. So <laughs> no, Me too. Uh, it'll be a fun conversation. We have David Haney with us today. He's our bird conservation coordinator for the agency. And Miss Laura Cook. Uh, the Bird Research Co Research Coordinator for Warner Park Nature Center. Thank you guys for being here. Yeah, Thank thanks you. for having us. It's great to be here. Yeah, it's going to be fun. Uh, David, you're no stranger to Wildcast. You've been on a few times, but tell folks who you are and kind of a little bit of what you do in your role and maybe a little bit of background on how you got to Tennessee and workforce. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I've been involved with birds since, you know, an early age when I used to do a lot of backpacking. And so I've been outside basically my whole life and and just really enjoy birds and bird songs and and so um eventually i started off as as a finance major and <laughs> that didn't seem to work out for me so so i had an internship and then went back to school for wildlife biology and and didn't know you could get paid for doing something this great and so it's just really exciting to to be in this career and i've been with the agency about 10 years now yeah um, conducting bird research and basically what we're doing is just trying to um, really look at the species that are of greatest conservation need and so I'm focused on all the non-game birds mm -hmm. and trying to keep them off the threatened and endangered list and, and we're trying to remove some of those threatened and endangered species and and um, just really work towards getting species off the list yeah all right well, that's funny you, uh, you mentioned uh, you get paid to do this. That's a that's a common <laughs> phrase right here. I can't believe I get paid to, to be outside and, and enjoy what you know what's out here and mm -hmm. and help protect it and and all that. So it's that's cool and that's a big jump. Finance oh, a while. Yeah, yeah. I, that, I learned something yeah, today about yeah, David. A, it surprises that's... some people. So. <laughs> No, this is not the route I want to go. <laughs> awesome, uh, Laura. Tell us a little about your a little bit about yourself and kind of how uh, you ended up at Warner Park. Have you always been a birder? No, not okay. really. Um, yeah, um, I, I mean, I would say I grew up sort of similar with David, where my parents we always had bird books around, and I 
knew all of the birds sort of in my backyard, but I didn't really aspire to be an ornithologist. I wanted to study coyotes, actually. Huh, okay. So I did my, my undergrad in wildlife biology, and then I ended up getting my master's degree studying birds. And that um, sort of just started me down this path of birds that I wasn't really expecting to do. Um, I did take a break from birds for a while. I worked for the Nature Conservancy um, for over a decade. I helped them with large-scale conservation planning for their science division. Um, but then when we moved down here about eight years ago, I started volunteering at Warner Park Nature Center and got really involved with at their bird banding station and just kind of decided I do <laughs> like birds and I want to do this. And that's how I ended up here. That's awesome. That's where, cool. where were you doing that work, the large scale conservation work? Well, I worked for the sort of the central science division within the Nature Conservancy. And so I was living in Idaho and oh, okay. Seattle and then Virginia, but our, our office was based out of Arlington, Virginia. Okay. Yeah. Neat. Cool. But I got to travel all around, and I love that job. It was a great job. Yeah. Well, welcome to Tennessee. Thank you. This is a great place to be, too. Um, in your title, it's BIRD, all caps. What does that stand for? I want folks to know when they see it on the screen. Yeah, so it's an acronym for BIRD Information Research and Data Program. And so it's the idea that, um, you know, this program is um, is doing research is the main focus of a lot of the stuff that we're doing. But another big part of it is that we are at Warner Park Nature Center. And so a big part of what we do is public engagement. So we have our bird banding station is open to the public and we have uh, school groups and homeschool groups and universities. So we do a lot of education and engagement as part of what is part of our research, which is for me, it's a perfect blend of doing the research, but also really trying to inspire people to understand a little bit more about birds and the importance of, you know, maintaining their habitat. You know, I never drive by there that the parking lot isn't almost jam packed. You know, it is you a, guys draw a good crowd. We there. do. We do. I mean, it, we're only nine miles from downtown Nashville. And yeah. so when you're when you're in the park, you sometimes feel you're really far away. Oh, but it is an urban park. We we have over a million guest every year wow that's great how, how big uh, how many acres is that area there do you know it's th i think it's like 30 over 3100 acres wow mm -hmm. it's a big park yeah yeah it's fabulous we'll have to go down there and maybe do a show from there i know it's you're I'm welcome thinking. come to the band station <laughs> <laughs> that'd be awesome um and one other thing i want to touch on before we get too deep you mentioned it uh well, it kind of led me down this path. Volunteer and support. There's a there's a link on your all's website where you can volunteer and help, and, and you're looking for those. Absolutely. Yeah, we have a lot of different opportunities depending on, um, you know, your interest and in the amount of time you have from, um, uh, yeah, so go onto the website. We'll connect you, and um, there's all sorts of ways to not only volunteer for the bird program, but to volunteer with Friends of Warner Parks, which is the program that supports the bird program at Warner Parks. And so all the full moon picking parties and everything else, they're always looking for volunteers too. Awesome. That's warnerparks.org. So go check that out. And and as we're going throughout the show today, you're going to see some video. You're going to see pictures. Uh, Graham Gerdeman, is that right? That's how you say that? Uh, he offered uh, up some photos and video for us to use today to help you know spice it up a little bit. And you see these birds flying. You can see some pictures. So thanks to him for, for letting us use that. And you, you know him. Yeah. Pretty well. Oh yeah, uh, he looked like he's got a great, great following on YouTube and yeah. a pretty cool site there. Yeah, go visit his site. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. So that's at Nashville Birder on YouTube, and then uh, Graham Gerdeman on Instagram. So, anyway, all right, let's jump in. Purple Martins, uh, David, tell us uh, if you see a purple martin, how do you identify it? Let's start well, there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it'll be exciting talking about purple martins, and so they're the largest swallow. And so when you think of swallows, like barn swallows, tree swallows, they're the largest species in that group and what makes these birds really unique is they're almost entirely reliant on human or man-made structures during the breeding season and so you'll see the gourds and purple martin houses as you drive around and so that's where they're nesting and, and so they're usually in these colonies um, and then when they go out and feed i mean they're feeding almost entirely on the wing and so they're catching everything as they fly um, they also get their water that way, too. And so you'll see them skimming low um, over these water bodies huh. wow. picking up. And so they really can um, consume a lot of insects and, you know, during the, the time that they're here. But, you know, they aren't here year-round, so they're only here just for a little um, portion of their annual cycle. And so um, once they're done breeding, 
which is about now they form these large roosts and they can be you know up to a hundred thousand plus birds um, and so um, recently uh, there's been a, a roost down in nashville that i think we'll talk a little bit yeah. about later um, but so th these are occurring all over um, the na or the eastern United States, and so once they're done with this pre-migration roost, then they'll take another migratory path all the way down into South America, into Brazil, where they'll spend you know, the the non-breeding season. Okay. And so, um, and then after that, they'll come back, and the, the cycle starts again. Cool. <laughs> that's 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 cool. When I think of a migratory bird, I think of ducks and and things like that. But yeah. this bird is a migratory bird and it it's making a it's a huge trick that sure is yeah uh -huh. and they're and these they're, they're they're really small i mean they're pretty small birds right you say it's the largest swallow but they're i mean like a robin size i'd say okay yeah it's cool i, I looking at the colors you know, it's a purple martin uh, but there's no real it's got some blues and i guess there's some purple there but it's, it, it's a deep it's, it's a dark a, yeah. isn't it yeah. yeah yeah deep color yeah it's it's a pretty bird so um there's been a lot of activity out here around the uh, the houses that are right oh, up yeah. at the office, and uh, it's been fun. I've been carrying my camera out there, putting it on the tripod, and getting some some shots occasionally. You know, as as the as it progresses, and seeing little heads popping out. Of the, you know, <laughs> hey, feed me, feed me. <laughs> so it's been pretty cool. Yeah, I think it's crazy that it it relies on man made housing i know yeah i, I learned something today so learn about i guess i mean it's hard to know i guess but how um, how long has that been needed i mean or how did they survive before well as long as, well native americans back in the day would put gourds up oh, oh and they yeah. would nest in those um there's some of the birds out west i've known for them to nest in some cavity and so they're in cavities of trees and other things um they'll also utilize that if if they need to yeah but, so uh, they'll adapt if needed yeah but the, in the east it's mainly you know probably 99 yeah huh wow 99 percent huh? mm -hmm. wow yeah so if um and i saw this on the site too if somebody wanted to uh put up some nests can they i guess uh, in that their home oh absolutely There's plans out there yeah the the best resource is probably the purple martin conservation association they're a nonprofit. Um, they have great instructions on the siting of where you put the gourds or the house up is really important they like to be close to a human structure but they also need clearance so they don't you don't want them near um, trees um, and there's some indication that they like to be somewhere close to bodies of water for them to get drinks but they and the the purple Martin conservation association also sells um, they've got great gourd systems and housing systems too so if, okay. if you're looking that's the best resource uh-huh is there a certain I know these out here are pretty high are there is that a factor too? certain heights and uh, yeah, I mean, that's this is sort of a standard height that they use. But the idea is that, you know, historically, way, way back then, they did they did roost in these cavities of trees. And so that, you know, just to be higher up. But mm -hmm. the thing that's nice about these systems that they have now is that you can have a baffle, like what you put on um, on the pole, sort of like you do with bluebird boxes. And that can prevent things like uh, raccoons and snakes from going up and predating the birds. Uh -huh. So these systems are, are, you know, really made, designed specifically for them. Awesome. Awesome. Well, uh, you mentioned this time of year. We're uh, late July, about to head into August. So the breeding has passed, right? And they're going to start roosting. Uh, you mentioned Nashville. So they're going to they're gonna be, uh, you'll probably see a huge roosting uh, uh Batches, or what I don't know what the word term is there, yeah. but you'll see them up on in the trees and maybe on buildings and things. Apparently, they like classical music pretty well because I remember a few years ago they they yeah. took a liking to to down at, near the skirmer horn. That's right, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. So they've roosted at several different locations over time down in Nashville. I know one was, you know, the first one when I got here was over near the stadium along the side of a, the highway, and then that one moved the next year or two um over to i think where the titans um practice their practice okay, okay. Yeah. yeah and so then there must be that, fans of the titans <laughs> <that's> right <laughs> <laughs> and so after that they moved over um to the Shermhorn. okay and so they were roosting there for several seasons and and now um they've moved back over to the titans so i think they are titans fans. <laughs> <laughs> and and now the the largest roost that's downtown is is there wow that they're, they're probably watching the new stadium being built yeah. 
Yeah, and and, and um, there is a, a Purple Martin Task Force group that's really working and trying to get everyone um, engaged and involved and, and can better communication amongst all the, the different groups and agencies. And, and Laura's really been involved with that effort. Awesome. Yeah. Hey, a fun fact I was just noticing on the notes, Jason, that you put together is the uh, oldest recorded um, uh, bird is 13 years and nine months. Wow. That's a long lifespan for a, for a bird, isn't it? It's not. Yeah. I mean, um, it's not typical, though. I would say for most uh, migratory songbirds, um, surviving that first year is the most challenging. Uh-huh. And then if they can survive it, a typical is probably five years. Uh-huh. So a bird that can live, that, you know, that individual that lived that long is pretty impressive. Wow. But that's not typical, I would say. Okay. Well, and I guess thanks to the work that y'all are doing with the tagging of banding, you're able to, you know, uh, track Otherwise, that bird never know and, that. and know that that fact that's yeah. cool but so let's get into some of that um uh let's start with uh with the banding i guess and and why we care you know i guess that's the reason we care about these birds that's why we're tagging and banding and tracking and but i'll let you laura get into some of that you know sure yeah so we do um at warner parks we have been monitoring the the gourds that we have there every year and um we document how many young, how many eggs there are, how many young um, fledge, and then we also are banding the young. And all of that information we're then submitting to the Purple Martin Conservation Association, who they're tracking that. So they have all these different folks who are documenting how many young are, are happening. And that, can, that just gives an us indication of how the population is doing over time. So we've been doing that. Um, we put our gourds up in 2000, and it took nine years for us to get martins to start using them. They're kind of very particular about um, so. Don't if you put up a gourd system or a housing system, don't don't be frustrated. It may take some time, but um, but starting in 2010, um, we started to have young, and we began banding them and monitoring the nest and submitting that information. We also, for banding purposes. Um, to have a, a banding permit, you need a permit through the USGS Bird Banding Laboratory, a federal banding permit, and also a state permit that we get through TWRA. And so our data at the end of the year, we submit uh, all of our banding data to both the Bird Banding Laboratory and to TWRA for their, um, so that they can use that for their research and um, as well. Awesome. And, and our, uh, our nests have been out here for a while. Uh, long as I can remember. Yeah, really. since I started working here. And so I guess we had birds for a while, and you were coming out here banding those and, and taking data from those, right? Yeah, and so, um, we, like I said, we've been banding for a number of years, and I would say we didn't learn a lot from banding. Um, and that was because the only way to really learn anything from banding the birds and putting a band on a bird is just a small little um, aluminum band that has a unique um, a u- a unique number on it. Uh-huh. And none of our the Purple Martins that we had ever banded had ever been record- recovered anywhere else or recaptured anywhere else. So wow. we would ban these birds and keep our fingers crossed that somebody <laughs> would find it and report it. Um, and it had never happened. But then... In 2000, when the Purple Martins started to roost down at the Schumerhorn, we, um, you know, my question was, we've had these birds that are just nine miles south of Nashville. I wonder if our birds are joining that roost after they fledge before they head down to South America. And, you know, putting a band on it won't answer that question, really. And so that's when we decided to put radio transmitters um, on some of our nestlings to see if they join that roost. And so we got a f- special federal permit to do that. And the first year we did that in 2000 and, um, 2021, we, um, we put six transmitters on. One of them, I think, was the transmitter was a dud. But five of those birds were detect- we detected at the roost. And so that kind of answered our question of, yeah. yes, our birds do. Uh-huh. Then my next question, the, fu- the following year, was, I wonder if other birds in other areas, you know, the surrounding areas. And so that's when I reached out to David and said, hey, you guys have purple martins. Would it be okay if we started putting transmitters on your birds here? Um, and so that's how that sort of all got started. Awesome. 
Yeah. So what did you find out with these birds? Are they going to Nashville too? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yep. This year we um, we've we've been doing it, I guess since um, 2022, but this year we put six transmitters on birds here, and all six have been detected. Um, uh, both by we have a handheld uh, receiver where we can go down, but we also um, Bridgestone. Um, has allowed us to put a, a temporary receiver station up on their Bridgestone Tower um, right in downtown Nashville. And that's allowed us um, to also detect um, all of our radio tag birds when they're in the area. And so all six of the the Ellington birds have been detected by that Bridgestone station. So we know they're going down there. Wow. Um, so that, that's that been really neat just to kind of answer that question. But I think there's a, the other things that are really we have learned from this. I think the one of the most interesting things is we have, there's a group of us, um, the Tennessee Regional MODIS collaboration that we started a few years ago, and David is, um, and T.D. Bray is part of that group, but we, um, there's, so when I was in graduate school, you would put transmitters on birds, and if those birds left your study area, that was it. You never knew uh -huh. what happened to them. Uh -huh. So these guys up in Canada said, what if we actually shared our information and collaborated? Well, and you know, that sounds know, like a good idea. A crazy <laughs> idea. And so they started this organization called MOTUS, M-O-T-U-S. And the idea is that all of these different researchers across North and South America can use the same radio frequency and share their data collectively. And so so now there's a network of receiver stations. If you go to modus.org, you can see all of these receiver oh, stations. Nice. And over the last few years, we went from having zero in Tennessee um, up to, I, I don't even know how many About we have. Probably, yeah, we have a lot in Tennessee. Wow. And it's the same thing across all of, um, David's been involved with the getting more receiver stations in the southeastern U.S. And so, so because we now have these receiver stations, what we have started to learn from our radio tag Purple Martins is that um, after, so when they're at the nest and then they fledge, so they leave the nest for the first time, they spend about a week in right really close to our nesting area, learning how to fly, learning how to forage. Um, I saw a bird the other day that had fledged for the first time you could tell he left the gourd and he had no idea what he was doing. And he <laughs> flew way up to the top of this tree um, that had no branches on it. And he tried to perch a few times and he finally grabbed a hold of a branch. And then he fell over backwards and was hanging like a bat for about 30 seconds until he figured out. So you think like these birds, they don't know how to fly. They don't yeah, know how to do anything. Right. So they're spending about a week learning how to be a purple martin. And then that's when they start to join these roosts. But one of the things with this network of receiver stations is we're learning that during the day, they're foraging through a huge, huge area of Middle Tennessee, Southern Kentucky. Even we've had birds detected going all the way up into Southern Kentucky and then coming back down to Nashville wow. at the night. Mm -hmm. So that's something that really we didn't know before. Um, and then we've also had some of our birds on their way down to South America, down to Brazil. They're being detected by receiver stations in Costa Rica and Mexico. And so we're starting to get an idea of their migration path as well. Nice. That's so just cool. within a few years from just putting bands on and not really learning anything to in the last few years, starting to really learn a lot more about their life history and their, their annual life cycle, which is really important from a conservation perspective. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I think that's what's so exciting about this technology. Yeah. I mean, now we're able to determine migration routes, stopover locations. It's, um, it's a all these, game changer yeah. in the world of ornithology. Yeah. And and it's not just purple martins, right? I mean, it's it's all kinds of birds, uh, you know. Yeah. yeah. And bats. And, and bats. bats. Yeah. yeah. Hey, tell us a little bit about the transmitters themselves that you put on the birds. Yeah. So there's there's a couple of different um, a couple of different companies that have that make these um, wildlife transmitters. We've been using transmitters from a company called Cellular Tracking Technologies, and what I like about those, the reason we we've been using them, is that they a few years ago um, are now making them with solar, so they're, they're solar powered. And so when you so for birds in particular, 
through the bird banding laboratory, we're required to put anything that goes on a bird has to weigh less than 3% of their body weight just to make sure that it's uh -huh. safe for the birds. And the problem with transmitters before these solar ones was that the battery is what's heavy. Right. And so you couldn't put them on small birds or bats. And with all of the, you know, the nanotechnology and then there's these solar transmitters, it's really, you're able to put them on smaller and smaller <laughs> birds. Like David's doing stuff with golden wing warblers, which, you know, five years ago, you could never put a transmitter on a golden wing warbler that would last right. a year. Um, and so it's really that all of that stuff is really changing the technology. So I guess with it being solar, then it's kind of perpetual, right? I mean, how long does that thing last? Well, what's interesting is, like, for example, I was down at the roost the other night, and a bird that we put a transmitter on last year at Warner Park Nature Center, I detected him uh -huh. um, or her, I'm not sure, um, at the roost. But, I mean, that's something that, again, a few years ago, we never would have had a transmitter that would have, the battery would have died. Yeah. And so the fact that it's solar-powered you know, theoretically, it could last the life of the bird, which, uh -huh. uh, again, will just allow us to learn more and more and more about are they coming back here every year? Are they going somewhere else? Yeah. Pretty amazing stuff. And I think uh, we may not have touched on this during the show. We touched on it before, but what size is the bird when you tag it, when you put that tag? Yeah, so for purple martins, um, the re the recommendation is that we put the tag on when they're exactly 20 days of age. And so it, at 20 days of age, they're still in the nest. They have started to get some feathers, but they're not they're not ready to fledge yet. They're not ready to fly yet. But at 20 days of age, they're the size of an adult. So they weigh about 50 grams. They're, they're the same size. And so when you put the transmitter on, it will fit them when they're an adult as well. But they're too, too young to be able to fly off. And so they're sort of the sweet spot where that's the age we put them on. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. Well, um, looking over my list here, I think we covered a lot of this. Anything else that we're missing that you want to make sure we we cover today? Yeah. So, um, you know, th this was the whole catalyst to to create at Nashville and make that an urban bird treaty city. And so, um, that's a designation by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for oh. the city for the city. And um, you know, what we're trying to do, this group is just trying to establish communications and make sure we're not all working in in silos and so um, the goals of this this urban bird treaty are one to conserve and protect habitat within um, the city um, second to reduce reduce bird hazards and so we have bird safe Nashville here that's you know looking to reduce window collisions and and light pollution is another thing um, yeah. that birds can <laughs> The cause their demise, you know, just by circling around um, these lit buildings downtown. And so, wow. um, and then the third is just education and outreach, just trying to educate as many people as, as we can about birds. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Um, if you get a chance, go downtown and try to watch them, right? Is that, is that, the best way to, to watch them roost and to find Abs them. Absolutely. And I would say if you're interested in volunteering, go to um, Nashville Martin Roost at gmail.com and you can we can get you signed up to volunteer and go down and engage folks on the amazing migration phenomena that's happening in nice. downtown Nashville. Awesome. Awesome. Wear your Titans jersey. <laughs> <laughs> and a hat. Yeah. Hey, the, the light pollution thing, that might have an effect or a reason why maybe the Titans... <laughs> Are dark, a little darker over there. Maybe, maybe, I don't know. Yeah. Just guessing. Yeah, I, I still think they're fans. <laughs> oh yeah, I, I do too. Yeah. Uh, well, I can this see is... that little teeny jersey that just <laughs> 0.7 ounces. Oh, oh there's the sticker. Yeah. We can make some stickers. I think you're onto something. Yeah, a little marketing. Yeah, there we go. Uh, well, appreciate uh, you, Laura, for being here, and Absolutely. David, thank Thanks. you for coming and, and lining this up for us, and. Uh, if you have a chance, a volunteer. If you have a chance, go downtown, watch them. Uh, come by our office and check them out, and it's uh, it's neat. Yeah, it is. And thanks for all the great work you all are doing. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, this is Tennessee Wildcast. Keep coming back. Keep watching. Keep listening. And we'll see you next time. Stay connected with TWRA by visiting our website at tnwildlife.org and follow us on Facebook, X, and Instagram. Join us as we celebrate 75 years of conservation in our great state. You can invest in Tennessee's wildlife future by purchasing a license at GoOutdoorsTennessee.com. That's GoOutdoorsTennessee.com.